Um, prayer, 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 the gift of prayer. When we think of as the definition that Mark uh, read to us this morning, uh, a lot of it's on our talking, our communication. But I like that word rapport because it is that, that two-way. Um, but there's something else that we don't, we kind of, we know about it, contemplation, meditation, reflection, but we get right to the talking and sometimes the listening. And that being still and knowing God part, um, that's something that we kind of sidestep in our busy lives. So I'm going to be focusing on that part of the gift today. One of my favorite authors, she told the story of when she was an eight-year-old girl going fishing with her grandpa. And so they were out there all day long fishing. He sat, his folding chair was right there at the edge of the water, a fishing pole bent over it, his crooked little silhouette, you know, and the last traces of the daylight were fading and still no bites of fish happening. He watched the lights dance. He didn't seem to care. There wasn't any nibbling even on his rod. Well, the girl, she was long ago bored, and so she had gone to his truck to play while her grandpa fished out on the water. And while she was in the truck, she discovers his fishing box with bait in it. And so she takes it out right away, rushes out there, and she's like, Grandpa, Grandpa, what? You, you, here's the bait. How can you possibly be fishing without your bait? And he kind of smiles, and, and he confessed to her at that point, today, sweetie, it's not about the fish I'm after. It's the fishing. It's not the fish I'm after. It's the fishing. I think this man, in his wise old age, knew the value sometimes of being still, of stilling the busyness in our lives, of not focusing so much on conquering and accomplishing and doing, but slowing down and breathing in. He knew what he needed for renewal so that his body could catch up with his soul. How many of us need to do that? Let our bodies catch up with our souls, like every day in this crazy world. But stillness and quiet, stillness and quiet, being still and quiet is so elusive and so hard. We know we need it. We've heard it, we've, we've tasted it sometimes, but we're busy, we're overworked, and the complexities of life, it starts to wear on us. We start to feel distant, we feel disconnected, and even with a bunch of people, we feel that loneliness inside, and, and things start getting out of sync. And I think sometimes if we could only fight off the fleeing and try remaining sometimes longer when we go to pray, longer in the quiet, longer in the stillness, then perhaps we become connected and whole again as we connect with our source of wholeness. To get there, it's stillness that we need. To be still and know that I am God, Scripture says. I think stillness is both the path we follow as well as a destination that we seek, a God-focused stillness, otherwise known as prayer. And it's a gift, I think. It's a gift that God brought to us and gives us because in that stillness, we have that opportunity like none other. When we slow down, when we stop, when we are still to know God, we have that opportunity to let go, to empty ourselves of our concerns, to, to cease from the noise and the going, going, going. And in that emptying out, we are more able then to receive in, receive in God. It's hard to be still, though, isn't it? It's, we stop, we try, we try lingering with God, but like, like a, a, the ocean, after a, a horrendous storm, it's still, even though the storm has passed, the ocean is still rough. And I think even with the mind, you know, when we withdraw from our busy existence, our mind continues to churn. And it's hard to slow that down. When finally we do, we finally find 20 minutes. We're like, okay, I'm going to take these 20 minutes and just be still with God. It takes about 19 of those 20 just to be still, just to stop all the stuff going in our minds. But I wonder if we could even just do that, if it takes 19 to get one minute in God's presence. What a reward that would be. And maybe as we continue to practice the stilling, that 19 becomes 15 minutes to get to those four minutes with God. And then the 10 and then five, and pretty soon we'll get the whole 20 focused on being still and knowing God. You may be like me and not quite understanding how prayer works. 
I have this, this, you know, my logic, my rational. I'm trying to figure out how does it work? Why does stillness work? Why, how does heaven and earth work with prayer? How does it work? And I think perhaps I read somewhere, maybe it's like plugging into electricity. We were talking about that today, weren't we, Ernie? (laughs) We won't go there. But when we plug in an electrical appliance or we log onto the internet, I don't know about you, but I don't understand how it works. I have studied it a little bit, you know, in school, but I still couldn't explain it to you. But I know the benefits I get from it. I don't understand how it works, but I certainly appreciate the benefits. Perhaps that's a bit like prayer. We don't understand how it works, but when we connect with the divine, even though we don't understand it, we know that somehow it opens up avenues for healing. It opens up avenues for hope, for encouragement, for strength, for guidance, for renewal, for life. We walk away feeling the benefit in our spirit and deeper soul, and sometimes over time then we experience that. I love the poem prayer that Madeleine Leingel wrote. I think it sums up the mystery of entering into silence with God. She writes, I who live by words am wordless when I try my words in prayer. All language turns to silence. Prayer will take my words and then reveal their emptiness. The stilled voice learns to hold its peace, to listen with a heart to silence that is joy, is adoration. The shelf, the self is shattered, all words torn apart in the strange pattern time of contemplation that in time breaks time, breaks words, breaks me, and then in silence leaves me healed and mended. I leave, returned to language, for I see through words even when all words are ended. I, who live by words, am wordless when I turn me to the word to pray. Amen. Good summary, right? I think sometimes, or a lot of times, we need to get to that same place where in our prayers there are no words. In our prayers, perhaps then we'll be able to hear God's words to us. Where time breaks, words break, and we break open, our hearts set to receive God. Through the ages, somewhere along the line, we've heard that prayer is a conversation. And I think that's a good picture. Prayer is a conversation. However, I think we've assumed that we're the ones that started the conversation. And we're the ones that have to keep starting the conversation when reality is is that God is, has always been, and always will be the initiator of conversation with us. He was always the one who's been reaching out to us. It is God who calls to you and I. It is God who desires to draw us to him. It is God who comes to fill us, to heal us, and to replenish us. And we see this throughout the scripture, and of course, in the Christmas story. If you go to Luke, you see in the words there, it's God who sends the angel to bring good news to Zechariah and Mary first. He leads with, you have found favor with God. You will be a part of God's gift. The Son of God is coming. Mary and Zechariah's response then, their prayers show their clear understanding that God has been at work far before them, preparing the ground preparing mankind, preparing the space, preparing the place, the room in the world, the room in our hearts to receive him. Mary's response after she says yes to God starts with God's goodness that he initiated. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices for the mighty one has done great things. He has performed mighty deeds. And she goes on. Zechariah's song of praise is the same. He starts with praise be to God, the Lord, because he has come. He has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. And those that walked most closely with Jesus when he was on earth, when they write about Jesus, especially John, they knew him as God. They knew him as friend. They knew him as Savior who always initiated out of love for us. 
John 1.16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another after another. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave so that we might have eternal life. In 1 John, we love because he first loved us. God initiates, God sends, God gives himself over and over again. And this we celebrate at Christmas. This is the gift of Jesus. When we are still in prayer and meditation, we will know this gift. We will know him. And prayer then becomes this great gift when opened open space, open place, open schedules, opening ourselves. When we do this, we are opening to receive the very presence of God, the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. God has always loved to be with his people. Mount Sinai, on down the ages, he sought as many ways as possible to connect with mankind, to talk with us, starting in the Garden of Eden, to give himself to us, to connect with us. But the ancient Israelites did what we too often do now. They reduced prayer, that time of connecting, to something they did. We reduce it to something we do, something we use to produce certain results or something we focus on trying to get just right, the wording right, so we can get good results. And we miss out on seeing and experiencing the perfect one through it all. The Hebrew nation, you go back to their ancient fathers, their ancient writers, they have always held prayer as the highest priority, as the greatest good prayer is listed as such. But in their attempts to never miss God, it became so formalized, so ritualized, that too often they missed God. Prayers were required morning and night and at 9, 12, and 3. Prayers were for all occasions, and they have lists of occasions that you have to know that you pray when you go in, when you go out, when you get up, when you lie down, when you wash your hands, when you're doing work, and the list goes on and on. For every action, don't miss God, don't forget God, do these prayers. They would have set places that they determined were better places to experience prayer. And when you prayed in these places, such as the temple or the synagogue, your prayers were more likely to be heard. They had repeated words and phrases that they would say over and over so that they would get into this hypnotic state, trying to make sure they don't deviate from the presence of God. Ritual. And then they had long prayers. It was a common understanding back then. They actually had a phrase that said, whoever is long in prayer is heard. They had this subconscious idea that if you talk long enough, then God will listen. Then God will respond. You have to maybe so finally over it, just shut up already. But they had somehow forgotten their own wisdom books. In Ecclesiastes 5.2, it says, you'll love this. Let words before God always be few. We're going to have that as a motto for anyone who prays up front. <laughs> Let words before God always be few. So when Jesus came to earth, one of the things that he did was he came to restore that gift of prayer back to us. It had become this thing that was not connecting. And he said, let me give that to you again. And Matthew 6 lines that out. And he says, get away and quiet. Get with God because the Father knows you and knows what you need. I love how William Barclay, the commentary, uh, sees it. He wrote, in essence, we have to remember that when we pray, when we pray, we come to one whose one wish is to give. When we pray, we come to one whose one wish is to give. And so if all we prayed was thy will be done, it would be enough. It would be enough to rest in his presence and realize the life that we would gain in letting him give to us as his love longs to do. I think it takes daring 
We have these, these concepts of prayer. We get into these rituals of prayer. We get into these comfort zones of prayer with our words. And I think to step out of our words, to step out of our comfort zones, to step out of what we're used to, what we've been taught in childhood or beyond, to take daring and, and explore, to go against the tide, to get into quietness and stillness, I think it requires some daring. And I think it does, it requires us to become like children, like kids again, because kids are open to mystery and wonder and to trying, willing to explore and learn. I think as we're going to become like little kids, to, to try to not just communicate with God, but to commune with him, when we attempt these times, we're going to fumble and we're going to stumble and I think we're going to sprawl sometimes in our attempts but I'm pretty sure that we're going to sprawl right into the amazing presence of God. I think when we get to the center of our emptying and our nothingness we're going to find our everything which is God and when we completely empty ourselves God is there to fill us up. We'll blunder and stumble, but it will be into the heart of God. And there we'll find our own heart as well. Our most complete heart, our most at peace heart, our most encouraged and alive heart when we come face to face with the one who created our hearts and loves us with all of his. So if and when we dare to try to step more into solitude, step more into reflective contemplation, we need to be patient with ourselves. I think just as we know that if we were to sit ourselves in front of a tree to watch it grow, we wouldn't see anything happening at all. But it's growing nonetheless, right? We just can't see it happening until over time you see the results. The same is with our soul and with our spirit, with our relationship with God. He is working in us. And we have to trust that when we sit and are still with God, though we may not feel or see how he's working, over time we will grow. He is working in us and we will experience that deepening relationship and we will recognize his presence and we will know God at a deeper way than we ever have before. But it takes sitting in his presence to know him. As with any love relationship, intimacy cannot be forced and it cannot be rushed. Deepening takes years and it develops with a constancy of contact one with the other. But I love how God reassures us through Jeremiah 29, 13. When you seek me, you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. Story after story in the Old Testament and New Testament, we see this as we are searching for ways to connect with God. God is out searching for us, looking for more ways to connect back. I love the famous quote that says, we take one step towards God, but God is taking a thousand steps towards us. We're going to do some of that stepping this morning. You see all these different prayer stations around. We're going to not just talk about prayer, not just talk about being still and in solitude, but we're going to seek him, making space, receiving the gift of his presence through prayer. These prayer stations, they've been set up, and I want to thank so much Gloria um, for, for going and researching different types of prayer stations and how to creatively help us connect with God. And Irene for helping her right hand to make a dynamic duo, all the Christmas decorations, all the decorations that we have, but setting up these stations so that we can experience God. And they and I and those who know about it have been praying about this time that we have because we want these stations here to help you open up yourself to receive God, to hear God, to give to God, to connect with his spirit and his presence. There's five stations. Um, there's one on listening, one on forgiveness, one on community, one on rest, and one on letting go. And the idea is when it's time to go, and I'll let you know when that is, when it's time, find a station that you wanna start with. 
And at each table, they have instructions. There's instructions that are upright on the table, but there's also on each end of the tables, there's a pile of instructions. And you're gonna have to take turns at the tables, but while you're waiting, you can be reading your instructions and there's scriptures on there to meditate and to, to be focusing on God. It's not, this is not a time that we're going to interact with each other. This is a time we're interacting with God. And so I really encourage you, I really encourage you to, to really take this time, not just to check it off and say, okay, I tried that experience. I did that thing. I, I tried that and move on. I really encourage you to open yourself up completely, to empty yourself because God is in this place. God is here right now. His spirit is here and he wants to connect with us. He wants to touch our hearts. He wants to speak to our spirits. He wants us to feel him, to feel his love and for, for us to be able to feel free to talk back to him. And so let's not rush this. Let's not do it just to do it for doing sake. Let's really take this opportunity to connect. I, I like to look at these stations as taste design, much like a menu. It's not giving you the full meal. It's giving you enough to tantalize you to want more, to want more of God, inviting you to further explore, to consider what new ingredients and options there are with this gift of prayer and what it can become. So at this time, we're going to dim the lights just a little bit more. And uh, if you can just find a station that you want to start at, and if one's kind of full, go to one that's less full. Um, and then I'll just make a note and we'll rotate. And for the next um, 20 minutes or so, we're going to be connecting with God. If anyone wants to have prayer said over them or to be prayed for specifically, George um, is our prayer team leader. And he said, just tap him on the shoulder and he'll be happy to pray with you as well. So um, I'm going to send you off now to pray and to be still and to know.
have a couple more minutes for the last ones to finish up. So just continue to reflect, reflect on the scriptures, listen, let your heart feel God. those who are still at stations can continue to to listen and be with God. We're going to do the same, but from here. Mark just um, pointed out the scripture from Psalms 84, 10. We're talking about it. sometimes it might take 19 minutes for us to get one minute of stillness with God. And Psalms 84, 10 says, you'll recognize this, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I hope that this experience that you just had will carry with you that wherever, whatever God stirred in you, whatever he spoke to you, whatever you felt from this, that you won't leave it here, but you'll carry it in your heart of hearts with you as you go from here. And hopefully you'll realize that it doesn't take much. You can light a candle. You can find a little tucked away place in the corner of your garden or a closet. I think Matthew 6, Jesus talks about shutting yourself in a closet, having some incense, whatever it is that helps you just calm down to find a place of peace of quiet of stilling our inner busyness that we can connect with God he is willing he is wanting just as Mary whenever she said yes he came and filled her empty space and the empty spaces that we give to God he will fill those too and so that empty schedule that empty mind that needs to let go of the worries and concerns and cast them onto him he says give them to me and I'll take it from here and then we'll draw closer together as you do I want to end with a prayer that um, an English bishop prayed back in the early 1900s the searching for God is through the ages and it doesn't matter where humanity is or what background they have we have a need that hole in our heart that only God can fill and so he continually calls to us and uh, so I'm going to close with this prayer for quiet hearts. If you'll bow your heads with me. Spirit of God, we pray that you rest the crowded and hurrying anxious thoughts within our minds and within our hearts. Right now, as we walk with you, let the peace and quiet of your presence take possession of us. Help us to rest to relax, to become open and receptive to you. Because you, God, you are the only one who knows our innermost spirits, the hidden unconscious life within us, the frustrated desires, the unresolved tensions and dilemmas. So cleanse us and sweeten the springs of our being. That freedom, life, and hope may flow into both our conscious and our hidden life. Lord, we lie open before you, waiting for your peace, your healing, and your word. We thank you, Jesus, for this time that we've had with you. Go with us now and don't let us go until we have come away to be quiet and still with you again soon. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Don't forget, if you have not adopted a child, we have four children. They're actually from two families. And you can adopt their names. They're the four that are on the top of the tree. And just write your name down so we know that you've adopted them. And just go with God.